the cosmic Christ, the mystery at the heart of our faith, especially for those of us who practice creation and spirituality, but should be there if you're any stripe of Christian, and is the version of Christ that is most accessible to all of the pagans that are out there. The deep mystery that pervades all of the life in the universe. The cause of Christ is the one through whom all things are made and who holds all things together. What does that even mean? Let's talk about the cosmic Christ in creation spirituality today as we walk together down creation's path. Hello everyone, my name is Charlie, and I am a Christopagan Druid and Priest of Bridging. Hello everyone, my name is Brian, I'm a Christopagan Druid and sous chef to the Dagda. Today we're going to be talking about the Cosmic Christ, and before we get too deep into this, I do want to make a distinction that we are not necessarily talking about the historical Jesus today. We may be talking about the mythological Jesus, the, the legendary Jesus, or just the idea of Christ and Christhood. But that they're a Venn diagram. There's overlap, but they're not identical. And I just feel like we need to start there to keep there from being some confusion. So before we go on, if you haven't already, don't forget to like, subscribe, follow, whatever the terminology happens to be on the app that you're listening to us on. We do original Christopagan and Druid content five days a week, Monday through Friday, and you don't want to miss anything. So we got a lot of stuff planned. All right, so let's get into it. The Cosmic Christ. The first time I saw the term Cosmic Christ, I just kind of stopped and just stared at the words for a while. And they're very much a, I can touch everything with my hands, except for themselves. It, it does seem to have like a touch of that kind of, yeah, I need to have a lava lamp and some mood lighting feel to it. I'm not just saying that. If you want to just hurt your brain, search Cosmic Christ on Etsy, because I do that every now and then just to see what's out there. And, oh... Oh man, the fact that there aren't marijuana leaves in the pictures was a mistake on behalf of the artists because they all should be black light paintings. Really, you have that that vibe about them. And I'm not saying that as an insult. It's just the way that this term is often encountered. Within creation spirituality, when we're talking about the cosmic Christ, we are talking about that Christhood that is, I would say, parallel to, but not synonymous with Buddha nature. So to me, when we talk about our Buddha nature, we're talking about an innate quality within us to come to enlightenment, to become a person who has freed themselves from the cycle of cause and effect. Somebody who, while they are still in the world, they are acting in it, not reacting in it, and have been able to free themselves from suffering as defined by Buddhism as the pain that comes through attachment and aversion because the Buddha still cried when he lost a friend. That means that enlightenment does not include the negation of all emotion. I think people get lost in that. The Buddha cried when he got news of one of his friends dying, but our correct, the, the cosmic Christ or our, our innate Christhood is separate and different. It is to me a way of talking about these Zel Elohim, the uh, image of God found within all things. This anointed nature that all life has, not just humans, all life, and by all life I mean all things, minerals, rocks, wind, fire, everything, to create, destroy, remix, and change things. To me, the Cosmic Christ is the heart of the Via Creativa, the creative path, and the Via Transformativa that is conceived in the via positiva, is gestated in the via negativa, and is born in the via creativa, and then lives out their life and power in the via transformativa. That's just how I see it, and has been a good way for me to understand the story. In a way, if you're a Star Wars fan, that's kind of like the living force. Yes. I, I would say that it's actually uh, the difference between the two, the Buddha nature and the T Star Wars references, which we do from time to time, the Buddha nature would actually be the living force and the cosmic Christ would be the cosmic force. The cosmic for that grand unifying in all things, whereas the living force is what's currently in a person. It's more that node of consciousness. So if, if you're a Star Wars fan and that helps you out, hopefully that helped you. If not, that was a lot of gobbledygook that you just went, uh, okay. And 
possibly hit skip skip. The idea of the cosmic Christ comes to us from the works of Paul, primarily in his letter to the Colossians and the Ephesians, where he is referring to Christ as the creator. Christ is the life of the universe, the one that created all things and in whom all things are held together. And this is a very grand view of Christ and a very old one, by the way. It's very important to note when I say that Paul said something, I do make a distinction between letters that Paul wrote and the letters that were written in Paul's name that need to be kicked out of the Bible because we don't need a, hmm, slavery is kind of good book. Like, look at you, Philemon. You have no point being in the Bible. Get out. Just like Joshua, we don't need a genocide sometimes is good book. Like, no, both of these need to be kicked out. But in, in saying that, that means that this book was probably written in the 50s. And I mean, literal 50s, like nothing before that. So within 20 so years of the crucifixion of Jesus, this very cosmic view is here. And it's not something that is unique to Paul. It's something that we actually see reflected in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's something that we see in whoever wrote the books of Enoch. And I'm just going to say books of very big there because the first book of Enoch is kind of a collection of three books already. And then we have the other books that we then number from there. So there's a lot of books of Enoch in this time period, but they portray Enoch himself as a very celestial Christ figure. He is referred to as the Messiah in several of these books. We actually get to see his heavenly anointing in se several of these books. And this very divinized idea of the anointed one is found for Christianity. Uh, that's kind of the point I'm trying to get, get to here. It is something that Paul is very much applying to Jesus and something that Jesus may have applied to himself. I know a lot of people try to say that the semi-divine language that Jesus uses for himself in the Gospels is something he would not have said himself as an observant Jew. If you read a lot of Jewish texts from this time period, because we do have quite a few from the centuries before and after the, the life of Jesus, he might have used some of this language. It is well within the realm of possibility, but we usually neglect the idea that he was a Jewish mystic and part of that tradition and try to look at him as a tabula rasa when that doesn't really fit any purpose other than I want to make Jesus into whatever I want him to do. In creation spirituality, the cosmic Christ is taken on face value as this energy, this spirit that does connect all things. And that is how we understand the crucifixion and the resurrection as well. And again, this Christian spirituality arising from the mystic tradition and the wisdom tradition, we can see that throughout. We've talked before about St. Louis de Mont and his wonderful, that moment he found a leper on the streets of Paris and picked him up, which like the bravery of that, because so many people were afraid to touch people with leprosy in this time period, picked him up, carried him into the church and laid him on the altar. And when he was yelled at by his fellow priests for defiling the building by bringing in a leper, he just shouted back at them, make way for Jesus Christ. That seeing Christ in the faces of the suffering and seeing that suffering as that crucifixion is core to the idea of what it is. And it is how I interpret the crucifixion. So whereas somebody who comes from a fall redemption model will tell you that Christ died for your sins, I would say Christ died because of our sins, because people were not ready to hear a message like that. As uh, Douglas Adams says in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, 2,000 years after one man was nailed to a tree for having the audacity to say, wouldn't it be awfully nice if we were kind to one another? Oh, which is such a spot-on explanation to me of what actually happened there, right? It's not as a sacrifice. I do not see the death of Christ in this sacrificial language of an angry God needed you to, needed to kill his own son to somehow not be angry anymore. Like, just try to think about that in any way, shape, or form. It just doesn't make sense at all. But it is the, the, a kind of self-defeating sacrifice in that I'm going to kill this thing so that it goes away, and by trying to kill it, only making it stronger. And that we see over and over again 
in the lives of so many martyrs from not only the Christian faith, but so many causes throughout history. And that it is the hardness of people's hearts and the error that they have found in their own ways that leads to this crucifixion that we see happening over and over and over again. As Paul said, the pains that I suffer in this life make up for that which is lacking in the crucifixion of Christ. And it's not, I deserve to suffer so that other people can be saved. It's everybody didn't see what happened to Jesus and went, oh yeah, maybe we really should be kind and loving our neighbors and turning the other cheek and all of the stuff that Christ taught. It's not that it's going to cause people to get there. It's because we haven't gotten to the love your neighbor as yourself and treat everybody like you want to be treated. That's why I'm su suffering. I'm, I'm crucified in the same way that Christ was, was. And we take that one step further into seeing that what we are doing to the world and to the environment right now is the largest crucifixion that we have done, that we have put mother earth herself, if you will, on the cross to be crucified alongside Jesus through the, I don't have a time for all of the pollutions and other things that we have done to make the environment just toxic and dangerous and causing climate change and everything else. And that, that in a nutshell is the idea of the cosmic Christ. You can see it in practice in the inverse, especially with the fall redemption Christians who so often they end up falling into the role of the crowd crucifying Christ yes. so that the message can die and not bother them anymore. So they can continue to do whatever bad things they're choosing to do be mean to their neighbors and ignore those in need. So I've had a weird debate in myself for a long time, whether or not the blood libel that is found in the gospels was put there just to be anti-Semitic or to take just, or as a distraction tactic or both, because it is that Imperial fall redemption church that is the first to yell, crucify him. We see this in the witch trials. We see this in the hunt for heretics that they the church went through see, first with Peter denying. Yeah. The very denial. Yeah. Basically, are you Christian? No. Didn't know the guy. Didn't even know. Dude, I don't know what you're talking about. We really need to do an entire episode on the gospel of Judas because I talk about it a lot. I, I'm trying to find an inexpensive, good translation because there are some bad translations of the gospel of Judas out there. And I want to be able to point to one that's not from an academic press that costs like a hundred dollars to read. Academic presses, please do better. Please. At least do inexpensive ebook versions, if nothing else. No one should have to spend $100 to read a tiny little book. Anyway, the whole point of that book is that all the people who think that they're wise and the, the leaders are the ones that are persecuting Jesus. We actually have this view of the end times. There's this beautiful apocalypse at the end. And if people aren't careful in some of the bad translations that aren't looking at the text carefully, talk about this as the apotheosis of, of Judas. The point of the book is even Judas doesn't understand. Judas is closest because he's not playing the games of, no, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. But he gets there when Jesus says, you understand me. And Judas all of a sudden goes, so I'm the best? And it's like, oh, she, you missed the point. And the book ends with only Jesus going to heaven. Mm. Like all the other apostles are condemned. The entire church is going to hell. It is an indictment of the rising imperial church. It's a very powerful book. And it's one that we should probably maybe de even dedicate a week to. I don't know if we can do justice to it in, in a single episode, but I need to find a good copy of it first. But if you're ever part of a mob that is chanting, crucify him, you are the antichrist. I'm sorry. He, he, you are. I know that can be very painful to think about because yeah, there are things that make us angry. There are things that really make us want justice. It is so hard in our own brains to wrap around the idea that justice and revenge are different things, that justice and retribution are different things. I can think of very few people that get on the list of the world would be better off if they were just eliminated. It's a list that I don't have to go through. When I say that, you probably have that list going through your head too, because they're the constant questions of, well, would you take out a baby Hitler? No, I would try to raise him better. I would take him away from his abusive family. Make him practice hard. Yes. A lot of hands. Today, all you're doing is hands. Yeah. yeah. You're just doing hands today. Yeah, all. You're doing one hour of hand drawing every day. But it's not just him. Because again, that's the problem of great man history. 
there still would have been a movement without him. Yeah. So taking out just that one man really probably wouldn't have, it would, may have slowed them down, but it probably still would have happened anyway because of the other people, the other cogs in the machine that were pushing in that same direction. There's very few cases where you can say that one person. They're usually, again, something that you may be able to have corrected earlier if interventions were done. I, I just, being part of a machine that is of a group that is chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I, I have never seen that make a situation better. I have seen it get people to go to the right. I've seen it get people to abandon their previously held beliefs and opinions and really harden their beliefs. It, it tends to harden people's hearts. And again, I, I've looked at the data, right? It doesn't, there's no good outcomes in the data. It doesn't dissuade people from engaging in bad actions because people always assume that they're the one that's going to get away with it. So deterrents like that really don't matter. We have to be very careful. And we also have to realize when we're in the camp shouting crucify him, when it's not immediately obvious to us. This is the problem that I have with a lot of the environmental protests that are going on right now because they think they're being so smart and so clever with pouring the soup on the paintings and all this stuff. I live... In, in the rusty buckle of the Bible Belt, I live in a very red state around the people that if you want to actually do something, these are the people whose minds you're going to have to change. And all you are doing is hardening their hearts against you. You are proving to them that you are a part of the problem, not the solution, that you're crazy and don't deserve to be listened to. And again, it's that whole idea. You're just in the crowd shouting, crucify him. No good comes to that ever. When you start playing around with this idea of seeing the world through this lens where you're trying to find the cosmic Christ in all things because you can find him in all things. Understanding, okay, so who does that make me in this story? And you start realizing you're either Judas betraying him or Peter denying him or any of the other 12 just running away and hiding. Like how many of us are the Mary Magdalene in the story that shows up is Lazarus. I'm sorry, I'm of the camp that Lazarus was the beloved disciple, not John. I think it's very clear when you read the actual book, Lazarus was the beloved disciple, not John. But again, head canon, can't, can't prove it. Or even the nameless guy that helps carry the cross. Like He actually is named. It's it's, it's a Simon of Caesarea. I, I'm I Catholic for quite some time. Yeah. We recite the... I thought it would be a fun, like, accentuate the point that most people are like, yeah, what is the name of that guy? And then you're giving him the name and they're like, oh, wait, they have a name? Yeah, yeah. They, they do have a name. But most don't even know the name because, like... Or St. Veronica, who wipes his face, or any of the yeah. others, right? Like, where are you in this story? Are you one of Herod's soldiers hunting down the child? Or are you one of the people helping them get to Egypt and yeah. helping them find refuge, letting them know when it's time to come back? This is like part of that mythic living. Is yes. like When you have that moment of awareness in a situation, it's a great opportunity to stop and think, what character are you playing in the myth? Because... Sometimes you'll find, ooh, I need to completely change my direction or, my, or the strategy of how, how I'm behaving or, or doing because I'm one of the people that you don't want to be cast. And I'm not saying this is true for every story in the Bible, but always pick the Mary. Generally, you're going to be in because the even in the Torah, I would rather be Miriam than any the other <laughs> characters. Yeah. Moses has problems, a lot of them. Aaron has problems, a lot of them. Poor Man, I mean, Miriam goes through some stuff that she does, does, doesn't deserve. Like, Moses, you were bad to your sister. But I guess the follow-up thought on that is if you do find yourself, like, for instance, being the Moses in the story, just be a better Moses because better is better, at least. Better is better. <laughs> oh, I'm already in the middle of the situation and I'm being a Moses. So, okay, I'm going to stop complaining. I'm just going to I'm gonna do the Moses part of just girding myself and going forward and just doing it. And I'm going to give credit to my brother and sister who actually yeah. did most of the work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Y'all know I have. Take a minute, look around yourself and recognize who in your life is being the brother and the sister there. Like, I know, in Christian <laughs> I know in a lot of Christian circles that he gets a lot of credit that he shouldn't get. But, I mean, for those, anyone who has seen any of the Clerks movies, he is the Dante of the Bible. I'm not even Dante, supposed to be yeah. here today. Yeah. Like he is the Dante of the Bible. Like his entire thing. Like I wasn't even supposed to be here today. Now I have to like go curse the Pharaoh. But yeah. Find out who you are in the story. And for those of us who have this feeling of like something died in November, because I see this a lot 
in a lot of posts. While I'm afraid that you are right, I have that same feeling. I've had Padme Amidala in a certain scene from a certain movie going through through my head a lot when I watch the news, but I'm still going to go to the tomb and wait for the resurrection. Because once again, choose Mary. Always choose Mary. Always choose Mary. Don't be one of the apostles cowering back at the inn, whining and crying. And, and the New Testament has so many Marys to pick from. Yeah, so many Marys. Pick the favorite Mary. There's so many of them. Or pick be a Joanna or a Susanna, because they're in there too. Um, there are a lot of women in the story that we forget their names. We didn't see Francis was a Mary. Oh, <laughs> definitely a Mary Magdalene <laughs> and a Mary of Bethany. Secret, yeah. um, but remember, the point of the story is that the resurrection will come. It may not come on your tiny. One of my favorite retellings of the gospel story is the greatest story ever told, the one with Jeffrey Hunter. And it's not because it's the best acted version. It, it, it isn't. It's not because it's the most beautifully shot. It, it isn't. It's this idea that Judas was just trying to force his hand. Like Judas was so convinced that if if he thought Rome was going to kill him, surely he'd call down the angels and he'd strike Rome down. And I think a lot of us tend to have that thinking sometimes and are that Judas from that story that surely if we make this like, because I feel like in the most recent election, a lot of people played that role of if we just... If you're in the crowd, shouting crucify him, you're often part of the problem because we need to be working for solutions. Solutions are what may th make things better. Nothing has ever been made better by standing against. It's about having solutions moving forward. I use the, the example of the civil rights protests a lot because they were able to at least temporarily achieve a lot of their goals. If they were just going, marching, saying racism bad, the the best you can hope for is people to go, yeah, agreed. And then everything stays the way it is. They had a specific plan laid out of voting rights and rights to be able to work and live. And they had, they had an agenda that they could organize behind and actually lobby for. And I think that you can see this, especially in the Christ story. The, the Marys had their plan. They had it all worked out. Well, this is life now. This is what we're going to do. We're not going to abandon the cause. If he's dead, he's dead. And we're going to prepare him like we're supposed to. We're going to do what we're supposed to do. They kept working at it, but they were still pro-Jesus. And that's, to me, the moral of the story. And that is the power of the idea of the cosmic Christ. Yes, the earth is being crucified right now. If we're lucky, we'll be able to do like Josephus did and be able to take our friend down from the cross and before they die. Yes, by the way, that's the thing that did happen in Rome. There was, it was possible. It was really hard to get a reprieve, but it was possible. You just had to lobby the right people, change the right minds. And Josephus was able to get a couple of his friends off of the cross. It is a thing that can happen. Or to continue our work and blessed hope of the resurrection and doing everything we can to bring that resurrection about, to keep the faith, to bring the goodness into the world. And I think that's a message we all need right now. I don't know about you. So what are your thoughts about the cosmic Christ? I would love to know. You can leave them in the comments. If you're listening to us on Spotify or YouTube, you can leave a comment right there. If you're listening to us anywhere else, even if it says you can leave a comment, they don't tell us that you've left comments. And there's only so many sites you can visit in a day. So leave a comment there because we'll get through this magic. And then head over to creationspast.com, click on chat, and you can leave a comment there. We will get notified and we'll be able to respond to you. While you're there, if you happen to have a few dollars, think about joining the membership. That helps us out a lot. Helps us to keep the lights on, keep roof over our heads, and food on the table. If you don't have any money, that's perfectly all right and truly understandable. Right now, I get it. I, I get it. But if you know anybody you think would like anything that we're doing, please share it. It does help us out more than you know. Alrighty. And as we are going out today, it's almost too obvious to pray to the cosmic Christ. So let's pray to the ultimate cosmic Christ. O oh, blessed and divine wisdom who played with God before the creation of the earth. Sweet mother who guides us with all her gentle prodding to do what is right and to find the good, wholesome, and healthy path throughout this life. Continue to guide us through all the dark passages through which we should go and help to guide us to the safer paths whenever possible. Amen. Amen. Amen.